Good morning. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit about the role of design and the role of open music, um, specifically in uh, engaging us, people, humans. Um, so I don't know a lot about the technology, to be honest. That's uh, the role of the other guys. But I will tell you that human behavior is probably the biggest challenge in, in this, ta this uh, task of uniting um, everybody together. So that's my role today. So I am from IDEO. We're a design and innovation consultancy. Um, we have worked in the music space some. These are a few of the projects we've done in the past. Uh, just to give you a sense that um, we're not totally uh, nascent when it comes to the space. However, it's not where we put our primary energy. Normally, we're working across uh, uh, large industries, whether it's communication, hospitality, uh, uh, B2B, a lot of the brands that you know. And, we're, and normally what we're doing is we're, we're taking our perspective from our studios around the world, uh, trying to identify what we call the latent needs and human behavior that can lead to new innovations for an organization. We do that uh, through something we call a cross-disciplinary approach. So for us, design isn't just about, say, making a chair or uh, making, you know, designing a cool poster or uh, you know, maybe uh, designing a building. It's all of those things, and it's more. It's the services that you create. It's the businesses that you create. Um, and in, when you unite those things together, unite the perspectives of the people together that are creating, you can create holistic experiences that lead to new innovations for people. Um, we do this through something called human-centered design. So um, I don't like to show a lot of diagrams, but this one's pretty important. Um, if you think about the way most things are invented, uh, there's usually three places they start. Um, technology, right? I have a new technology I want to share with the world. I think it's really cool. I think everybody else will think it's really cool too, so I'll launch it. Um, a business idea, like you might go to business school, you might create a model for a new business idea. On the spreadsheet, it looks really good. You're going to be a billionaire in two years, right? <laughs> And then people's needs, which is ironically the place where we usually don't start exploring new inventions. So I'll give you an example. Uh, how many of you own a Segway? Right. None of you. <laughs> all right, it was, a, it was a technology invented that nobody really wanted, all right? Um, and it, yeah, it's used in warehouses some, but if you remember, its promise was we're gonna reinvent urban transportation. Bicycles no longer needed, walking no longer needed. We're going to ride our Segway around. Um, it's a good example, I think, where the human, the human factor wasn't considered, right? There's so a couple things. Safety was one of the first concerns. Once everybody started talking about having these things on the street, it was just another mode of transportation that could possibly run over you. That freaked people out. Um, another is, I, I know this sounds a little shallow, but it's kind of hard to look cool on a Segway. You have to admit, right? Like, you're not driving down the road, you see someone on the Segway, and you're like, oh, man, next year. <laughs> That'll be me. There, there's an emotional component to this as well, right? That, I mean, think about that compared to like, like a dude on a Harley. Everybody wants that. That looks cool, right? But Segway, not the same. So there's an emotional factor we need to solve. So when you're designing new, new technologies or uh, new businesses, you always need to start with the person first. So how do you do that? Well, again, it's kind of obvious, but you listen and you observe, all right? And notice those are actually two very passive activities, right? We want to see what people are doing. We want to understand their behavior um, through observation. And we also want to talk to them and understand their motivations for their activities. So in this diagram, you can see, uh, it, you probably, you probably recognize this, but what people think is not necessarily what they say, right? And what people feel or believe isn't actually what they do. Now, a good example of this would be um, when you fill out a survey or you're responding to a questionnaire, human nature is to try to either please the person you're talking to, try to say the right thing to the person you're talking to, or it could be trying to hide some kind of behavior you're ashamed of. Right? When you go to the doctor, like, they'll ask you, how much do you, you know, how much alcohol do you drink? 
You're like, oh, I, one a day, right? It's probably, probably a lot more. That's, and doc doctors overcompensate for that. They go like, one, all right, yeah, three. All right, that's the way they do it. <laughs> um, we just don't tell the truth, and we don't mean to be uh, deceiving, but if you really want to get to the bottom of something and what people want or what people need, you have to look under the, the rug, so to speak. So um, if you can see this slide here, these are examples of workarounds. And workarounds are the hints that start to uh, reveal latent needs or latent desires, OK? So I'll explain some of these. Some is kind of obvious. Like, who drinks tea? All right. Have you ever had the problem of the, uh, the tag falling into your tea when you pour the water in? <laughs> this is still an unsolved design problem. <laughs> All right, so what is the workaround? You wrap it around the handle of your cup, and it usually stays. Right? That's a simple one. Um, you can see this one photo where people have all uh, put their coffee cups along the subway. What do you think might be happening there? Do we have a lot of litterers in this town? Just everyone's just throwing their rubbish everywhere? No, it's, if, if I were working in that space, I would say, oh, maybe we need a trash can <laughs> at the top of the stairwell <laughs> um, because obviously people can't take their drinks down into that space. Um, I love this one with the pencil. This is not what a pencil was designed for, but this is what a pencil is often used for, especially in the digital age. Uh, the bottle of beer. The seat belt <laughs> is, is holding the beer, right? So when this person is traveling back and forth, it's not spilling over. So there's a there might be a design opportunity in a car when you see something like this. You think, oh, maybe we need to put something um, in the car so that people can hold their groceries and they're not falling around. Uh, the fan is an interesting one. So this is at a bar, and someone has just taken the salt shaker. It's an oscillating fan. They've taken the salt shaker and shoved it into the fan to keep it from moving. All right, so I don't know. Maybe, maybe the fan was making everybody too cold, or maybe they were too hot and they wanted the air. But again, it's a hack. It's a workaround. And the, other, the others you're probably familiar with. You can see in every one of these situations, People are doing things with the object that it wasn't designed to do, be used for, correct? And that's what's interesting. So think about your own workarounds. You may not even be aware of them. You may think about someone you're close to, you're aware of theirs. More than likely, you might find them annoying even. But those are hints about something that's not working right. All right, so on to the topic. Is the world populated by music thieves? <laughs> right? Is it? I don't think so. I think there's something else going on. And so if you look back and you think about the, the history of music, what is music? Is it an individual activity or a social activity? All right, it's a social activity. Um, I mean, I've, I, I um, actually grew up in a family that on family gatherings, they would do this. So they'd get around the piano and we'd all have to listen to them sing. <laughs> uh, you know, play your favorite song, we all sing together. It's a social activity. It brings people together. Or the era of mixtapes. Did you ever make a mixtape for someone you had a crush on? Yeah. All right, did you get one? It's very cool, right? It's, it's a way to express your personality. It's a way to express your feelings. Um, it's a way to identify with a political position. I mean, music is powerful, and it's a social tool. So this is my interest in the Open Music Initiative. Right? I mean, we know we've been through the era of trying to stop the socialization of music in the digital age. Right? That didn't work out. <laughs> Human behavior won. Right? But no one's trying to do the wrong thing. Everyone's just acting by the nature of the way we are as people. And so the question is, can you help technology catch up with human behavior? That's what we want to do. So last summer, um, in collaboration and sponsorship of Berklee College of Music, we launched the Open Music Initiative Summer Lab. We invited students from area college in Boston and beyond to explore uh, some of these concepts about what the digitization of music could mean in the 21st century. It was very short, so we did two sprints. Um, each sprint was a week which is really fast, <laughs> I recognize. 
Uh, but the first one was focused on creative data, getting data into the system. And the second was on fan engagement. It was very structured. So these, on those five days of each sprint, you had day one was generating ideas, generating concepts. Uh, day two was prototyping them, actually making them. Day three was interviews with artists uh, to test the ideas. Uh, day four was iteration upon the feedback that we got from the artists um, and other music industry uh, experts. And then finally, refining it and presenting it, five days. Uh, these are the two specific work, uh, working briefs. So what new workflows might we design to gather critical information as mu music is being created? Now, this is one of the biggest challenges we have right now. Um, we know how to make data flow between systems, but getting good data into a system is quite a challenge. The other, what new fan experiences might result? And this one I was particularly excited about, because in some ways you're asking yourself, what is the, mo what is the new version of a mixtape? Right? If, if we have good data in a system, um, it's a bit like having great ingredients for a dinner. Um, if you have all of these things here, then what could you make as a fan? So the students were together at Berkeley and at IDEO. Uh, they did interviews around town. They did uh, what we call immersive research. So they, they spent some time in record stores. They spent time talking to their colleagues. Uh, they did online interviews on Facebook. Um, um, and in the end, they were able to craft some, some early ideas. The other thing that was really cool is most of these students were music students, Berkeley College of Music students, with some RISD students, uh, which is Rhode Island College of Design or uh, MIT. But the cool thing is most students have what I call um, transferable skills. So as musicians, they've learned how to collaborate. They've learned how to problem solve. They've learned uh, also how to use technologies, how to, pro how to program, how to uh, demo an idea. So they were actually able to bring a lot of these ideas to fruition quickly. There's 12 concepts that came out of last summer. I'm going to share four. Some of them you guys will find, I think, relevant to your own businesses or your interests. The first one is this one called On Record. It's a very simple idea. But the idea is that um, every audio source could have an audio a fingerprint through a, a, a quarter-inch jack that would plug into whatever, an amp, soundboard, etc. cetera. Um, and their concept was, we'll just put an audio f signature in, in the uh, out of the human range hearing, uh, which will be a unique identifier to, identifier to that particular plug, and therefore the person who registered that plug. All right? So it's a simple idea. It's a cool idea. Um, it's actually quite possible. And this is what we liked about working with these students, is they were thinking ahead. They were thinking in terms of their own experiences as musicians. What kinds of things would they be comfortable with? Um, another idea was Aura. So Aura was a bit like um, the idea that Pontus was talking about, that Harmonix is, is going to launch as a new uh, game. Choose 10 muses is a bit like your favorites on your phone for call. But imagine your favorites are 10 musicians that you like. Um, and this idea was that you could combine the music of those 10 artists uh, based on your experiences. So if I'm working out, I want to auto-generate music that's using these influences that I enjoy to create new sounds. And that, now, this sounds a little far out. However, when I was in Tokyo last year, I actually saw a business that Google had done with a real estate company that created this very experience. So it was applied like this. If, you wanted, if you're walking around Tokyo and you want to get a sense for what that neighborhood feels like uh, in case you want to rent an apartment there, how would you know? How would you get a vibe? Well, the collaboration with Google said, we have all this data. We have the data of traffic flow through the neighborhood. We have the activity of the stores. Um, we have the weather report. We have the most searched for terms. We can tie all of those activities, data activities, to musical stems and then generate new music through artificial intelligence based upon that data. So um, they weren't using, they weren't, they did work for higher music. They weren't working with, uh, you know, uh, signed artists in a sense, but they were creating the same concept, right? So if I'm walking through a neighborhood, I might have like a really chill jazz 
uh, tuned to this neighborhood. I might walk to this one, and it's actually really dynamic and frantic and EDM-based, right? This is a real thing in existence right now, right? So if we can figure out the rights management, think, imagine opening up an idea like that to your whole library of music for your own daily experience, whether you're at the gym, your commute to work, et cetera. Um, another idea was interstellar. This idea, um, again, there was actually an experiment that Echo Nest did with Blue Note several years ago. But if you want to follow a musician's career, uh, maybe a bass player, a drummer, a background singer, it's kind of hard to do that right, right now, right? Because there's not good data. Uh, maybe you could follow it through liner notes at some point, but today, not so much. So what this team did is cr created an idea for an online service that actually let you track those session players or, or track those uh, 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 jazz musicians through the catalogs. Um, it's a new kind of fan experience to be able to do something like that, right? I mean, we all have our favorite artists. We don't know about all of their side projects or uh, the people that make it possible for them to perform. This is a way to have um, a new kind of uh, nerdiness, so to speak, to music. It's a bit like you know, um, people who love uh, football or baseball. They love to follow the stats all the way along. This is a new way to create that kind of experience. The last one from that group I'll show you is something called Campfire. This was a, an idea for creating derivative works. And I love the metaphor of the campfire. Everybody's sitting around the fire at night, singing songs, playing guitar. Oh, I love that riff you're doing. I'm going to add it to my song. I'm going to add some words to it now. Like, oh, you like that? Cool. You want to add, add some harmony to it? Great. And you, you kind of build a song. That's the way music has grown for years. Um, you know, in, uh, in America, if you look at the way that, if you look at the old church hymnals and you look at the melodies that are in those church hymnals, they actually came from bar songs uh, from the immigrants uh, that came over uh, initially. Um, and the reason was because they were familiar tunes. Everybody already knew those tunes. You just changed the words. This is the same kind of idea. Um, you upload your, your track. Someone else builds on it. They recognize your contribution. Now they have another byline. Someone else adds something to that. They have a byline, et cetera. So you have this new work that was inspired uh, by somebody else that now you're a contributor to. Now this summer, uh, we're doing another lab. We just kicked it off last week um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, this one is not using uh, what I would call speculative design to think about the future. This one is actually uh, working, on for, working toward live market prototypes. It's actually a nine-week program. It's a collaboration between IDEO, Berkeley, uh, Intel is a sponsor. And the idea is to take uh, eight weeks to take some of these concepts we had looked at last summer, but then actually push them into the market ex as experience that people can play with, that all of us here can actually take the code and work with. All right? Um, it's these four use cases, cataloging, attribution, and distribution of live DJ mixes. So this is a challenge right now. If, if I'm performing, I'm feeling the crowd, you're feeling me, I'm deciding, oh, I've got to drop this next record. There's no, there's no premeditated list that we have right now that can tell us, oh, this is what was played that night. Right? So we're very interested in this space um, to be able to catalog live DJ mixes and be able to have attribution for that. Um, the second is one we're all familiar with, taking uh, uh, back catalog, creating co new commercial hip-hop mixtapes. Um, so new with old. It's a very interesting challenge that we all face. You know the lore of uh, Public Enemies um, album that had so many samples in it that if you actually tried to get rights to them, it would have been cost prohibitive, right? And that actually changed, it caused uh, change in contracts and law because it was so radical. All right, so, but, but that was a natural behavior. We want to try to get back to that. And an underlying infrastructure can let us get back to that. Um, musicians compensated for visual works that are created from their musical works. Now, one of the cool things I, about this festival is there's so much virtual reality going on. Yeah? I mean, it's amazing, all the different exhibits. Um, a lot of the base layer of information now 
for visuals in, a, in software can be created from the music itself, from the, from the tempo of the music, for example. Right? I want to base, I want to base the tempo off. Or maybe even from the uh, visual structures. You can actually start with the musical uh, files, and then you can just use it as an inspiring way to get started on your color palette or on the, the graphics around you. Right now, there's no good way to say, oh, that, that visual system was actually inspired by the music. Right? So we want to we dig into that and solve that this, this summer. And finally, individual attribution for single tracks. So this goes back to the campfire idea. Right? Can we actually take that and build it so that uh, we can track an individual contributor to a song? Now, that one seems a little bit uh, boring or old in a sense. It doesn't seem as cutting edge. But I think it's actually the most pertinent because all of you are creators. If you use social media, if you use Facebook, if you post anything to YouTube, if you take a video of your family, throw new music on it, now you just created a new, a new work of art. This is going to continue to be the trend. At this point, creators and consumers are the same. And solving this at a micro level first will help us start to understand, can you flip the whole industry over at some point and say, actually, there's millions of creators that we're servicing and we're uh, correctly uh, following through attribution. So these are some of our fellows. Uh, you can follow us online if you go to um, the blog on Medium. If you know the Medium website, there's an open music channel. Uh, students have started blogging about what they're working on. Um, you can also go to uh, open-music.org, and we we'll begin posting the blog posts there. Uh, finally, the students are working with the API that the Open Music Initiative is launching uh, this month, I hope. <laughs> if not, uh, by the end of the month, very beginning of July. This is the first uh, API that will allow the interoperability between systems. All right? So the membership of uh, the Open Music Initiative has gotten together over the last year and said, what is the minimal amount of information that we could share with one another to tie uh, audio tracks with publishing information? Um, so the students will be using this as well. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Marco.